Warm welcome, everyone, to this conversation in the studio. Um, we have some competition of the former Secretary General for, for uh, the United Nations, uh, Jan Eliasson, who is out there talking about the situation in the world and how to solve the global issues that we are facing. But we here in this studio will penetrate some of uh, the most important issues that are out there right now in the current situation uh, with the war in, in your home country, uh, the Ukraine. Uh, I will introduce myself briefly and then I will hand over to our distinguished guest, the author of this book, to, to make a proper introduction of yourself. My name is Louise Limfors. I'm Secretary General for a solidarity organization called the Africa Groups. We work in solidarity movement and development cooperation in the southern part of Africa. But we're also, as mentioned, a solidarity organization and we're also a feminist organization. So I know that there are many linkages between our different positions in the world and how we work. And I look really much forward to discuss with you and to, to sort of explore the possibilities, both of literature and of, of a, a feminist approach to politics. <laughs> so warm welcome to Victoria Belim, uh, the author of this uh, Röda Sirener that is just fresh from the prints at Bromberg's Förlag. Warm welcome. Thank you very much. So my name is Victoria Belim. I'm a journalist, writer, and a translator of Persian literature. And uh, I'm originally from Ukraine, but I live right now in Brussels. And this is my first book. The book is about my family. It's, uh, it's about uh, looking at Ukraine's history through a personal narrative and uh, through search for roots and belonging and for old mysteries. It's uh, somewhat of a detective story, as you're already mentioning. Could yes. you elaborate a little bit more on the form? Um, I should probably give a little bit of a background of how the book originated. Because originally, in 2014, I wanted when... Just one second. Can you hear her? Or sh yeah, maybe if you adjust the mic a little bit like this, because it's a tricky environment here. In 2014, when uh, the war started, and for me, the war started in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and the sponsoring of the separatist movement in Eastern Ukraine. When the war started in 2014, I decided to return to Ukraine, the country where I was born, but where I had not lived for many years, to explore and to spend time with my grandmother, Valentina. At the same time, I discovered a mystery in my family that we had uh, a person who disappeared in the 1930s and about whom no one talked about. It was uh, like he was completely erased from the family narrative, from the family history, and uh, I became shocked by that discovery. I was determined to discover what exactly happened to him and why no one talked about him, why the subject of him remained a taboo almost a century later. So that was really the genesis of the book. And the late motive of the book is uh, the mystery, the search for this person. He was my great grand uncle who vanished in the 1930s. And it's a search through archives, through family stories, and uh, a convoluted journey that took me throughout Ukraine as well, from east to west, from north to south, as I traveled and I, as I explored. This is so interesting because there are so many threads when it comes to this kind of inherited trauma in a way, that linkage, the linkage between now, we're, now you are facing a, a situation where you are in a full war, but as you're mentioning also, the threads go backwards through generations and also link us to the time before the Second World War and, and that sort of the, 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 the paramount to that crisis and to that war. Um, and I also think it's so interesting to, because you make it into a detective story, but it's also a research pro project in a way to, to find out this family uh, secret but then you intertwine it with your, uh, your own story, so to speak, or the, 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 the 
the person in the book story. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, when, uh, when I started searching for Nicodem, I thought originally, I was quite naive. I thought that I would ask questions of my relatives, ask questions of my grandmother and find out whatever happened because my grandmother, she's the custodian of family memory and uh, so she would be the one to help me. However, what I realized very soon is that she's not interested in helping me at all. So if I wanted to find out anything, I had to go my own way. I had to do my own search. And uh, my grandmother, then she expressly forbade me from digging in the past, as she put it. Yeah. She said that our past was so bloody and traumatic. The history of Ukraine of the 20th century is so brutal. Then there is, it's, this past is too, is too painful. Uh, spend time doing something else. Do not pursue this search. However, I felt that it was important to do it. It was important to commemorate, it, important to give voice to someone who was erased, who fell into the cracks of history. And, uh, and it was important to me, not simply for our family, it was important to me as a political scientist, I'm a trained political scientist, I'm used to doing research on similar topics. Of, co of course, it was the first time I've done it for something so personal, something so close to me. And it felt important because in Ukraine, the history is still unprocessed, and especially the history of the Soviet uh, period is still unprocessed and undiscussed. And uh, we have, uh, you can see how from a family level, this percolates to the national level where we don't talk about certain things. Certain traumas are simply not discussed. And that's a problem for me. Part of the trauma, tragedy of this war right now is, is exactly linked to that. For me on a personal basis, this is also so interesting because my mother had similar uh, dilemma as, as, as you have <laughs> in the book. Uh, her mother was also victimized by the Second World War and and she decided to it was her strategy for survival I guess to not tell the story to not pass on what has happened in the past as you're mentioning she felt it was too violent it was too bloody she didn't want to share it she didn't want to pass on that that trauma but what she did by staying silent and and um, actually she, s she was very dramatic. She was like, I'll take my secret into the grave, which she did. It also made another trauma. My mother was also a researcher and, sh and she w was proud of her achievements as, as a scientist, but she couldn't really figure out, she couldn't even know her proper birth date because it was all blurred and, and the traces backwards were, were um, traced out. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I really can relate to this kind of, um, kind of um, project that you have entered by writing this book. And also, I have to mention, my daughter's name is also Valentina, as your grandmother. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, sometimes things seem to intertwine in, in weird ways. But if we move then towards the situation right now, you are a Ukrainian uh, writer and researcher and, and, and you have a, a situation in your home country that is completely uh, disastrous. How, how do you continue your work and what do you do with the, with the book to, to sort of strengthen the situation in, in your country and are there things that you could, could sort of keep on working with? As a writer, the, that's what I do, I write. It's uh, something that I do best. And uh, I only try to continue writing. Some days it's extremely difficult because when I read the news, it uh, often completely distracts me, puts me in the state of mind where working is very difficult. But with the book that I've written, I feel that it elucidates so much of Ukraine's dilemma and Ukraine's very complicated relationship with its Soviet past, that someone reading it would be able to see the echoes of the wars past and present throughout the narrative. So as such, the book helps the reader to understand so much better Ukraine's predicament. And as well, another important element is Ukraine's culture. 
because that's the leitmotif of the book as well. As I travel in pursuit of these old mysteries, I encounter artists, I encounter craftspeople, and I share their voices and their stories along the way. Are you currently living in, in uh, Ukraine or are you uh, in exile? I live, uh, I live in Brussels. I've been living in Brussels for the past 10 years, so it's essentially my uh, home base. Uh, I used to return to Ukraine several times a year and uh, I still have family there. Um, but in the, past, uh, in the past couple of years, I have not been able to return. And what are, what are, what are the messages that you receive or perceive from, from your family and from your relatives? And how do you, how do you work with, with the, I mean, I guess the war is not, you are not in the war zone, but the war is in you. And how do you work with that um, healing, in a sense, while it's happening and, and what can you do as you're a writer but you're also within some kind of solidarity movement then with it, for, for your country as living somewhere else and how can you support them? Uh, on very basic level we've been working with refugees in Brussels to support them with food packages and uh, some uh, very uh, basic, uh, basic means that they might need when they first arrive to support them with information, with acquiring the proper ways to navigate Belgian bureaucracy and so on. In Ukraine, the messages from my uh, friends and family, they're usually quite positive and uh, uh, they're incredible in their courage and their resilience. And for instance, my cousin, he stayed in Ukraine and he stayed in, in our native village uh, where my grandmother used to live. And uh, he continues to cultivate our orchard there and also working with refugees that are arriving in our region and uh, creating care packages for them with the support of the family and uh, donations from uh, various uh, people and charity organizations. So in a way you help someone else and, uh, and that helps, uh, helps us to stay strong. But I have to say that my friends and family back in Ukraine, they're often much more, much stronger and more resilient than I am. I feel uh, being outside of Ukraine is, uh, at this time, is extremely difficult because sometimes you feel so helpless. What can I do? What are your expectations on moving forward when it comes to, to the, the more policy level? Like, what, what can the EU do? I know that they are very <laughs> interested uh, in supporting in many ways, but, but from your perspective, what are the roads forward and, and what entities needs to level up? What can the UN do, for instance? There's, um, there's the cost of reconstructing Ukraine is going to be absolutely massive. But there is some uh, support that we can provide, even on basic level, to people who are currently struggling, to various um, uh, civic organizations, grassroots organizations. Those organizations do not have support from Ukrainian government or don't have enough support. And that's something very basic that we can do. Uh, of course, we can talk about supplying of uh, weapons and information and uh, various military related uh, aspects but for me there is something very basic that can be done and it's still not done fully to return uh, to your book it's a it's a history it's a family history but it's also some kind of message to the future in a sense uh, would you like to share a little bit on on your like the mission with the book and and why I know why you wrote it in yeah in a more <laughs> um, yeah uh, w w the background you told us the background but what what would you say is is the future of your book and what do you hope for it to achieve it's just been published here in Sweden and I guess also many countries are to follow uh, what are your expectations and hope for the book the book when I wrote it the story although the story has a very tragic elements to it. It's also a lot about resilience and courage and inspiration. So the message of the book is quite hopeful. What characters uh, are doing in this book, 
they are basically showing us ways in which we can cope with calamity and whether that calamity is war or cl climate change or anything that we might face daily they give us particular lessons and that's very important to me so to end on a very hopeful note uh, in this book it's basically an inspiration a very hopeful inspiration for how do you cope with a difficult situation the universal theme of the book is family but also about grief and loss and how do you cope with grief and loss and uh, and of course grief and loss they come in many shades and many nuances but also the ways to cope have very different dimensions I think it's amazing to, to find how literature and the words and, and uh, the arts, in a sense, can, can be that kind of message or answer to, to the existential anxiety that we now are facing in so many levels, as you're mentioning, both the war in, in, in Ukraine and also other wars going on in the world and the climate crisis and uh, catastrophe, etc. So what is your message to the Swedish audience and those reader who has, has not yet read the book? Like, uh, what do you want to send them off with when, when they go and purchase the book and, and start reading it? I would say that uh, the message comes uh, from my grandmother, Valentina, and the message is that human heart is a strange instrument. It uh, you gets used to pain, but it never ceases to hope. So go find beauty, create, grow your own orchard. And the orchard is a very important element of the book, as you know. Well, thank you so much. And uh, it's been amazing to have this conversation with you in this also very intimate space. So I, I guess you will stay here and also be able to sign the book and, and talk to people uh, in, in this amazing space. And thank with you much so pleasure. much for sharing. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you, thank you so thank you. much. Thank you.